We're going to introduce Allison Yee as our first speaker from the Jack Gilbert Lab. Hi everyone, thanks. So as Josh mentioned, my name is Allison Yee and I am just finishing up my first year working with Jack Gilbert. And so our lab is really interested in microbiomes of all kinds. Some people work on the built environment, um, I myself focus on human health, and so today I'm going to be talking about microbiome determinants of health outcomes in preterm infants. So what is the human microbiome? Well, it's a very popular buzzword these days. It's appeared in addition to in Nature and Science, in all kinds of popular science publications. And it's kind of important to understand the human microbiome because when we think about the human, we think about being composed of about 10 trillion human cells. Well, we're outnumbered with about 100 trillion microbial cells. And in terms of gene content, which is what the microbiome refers to as the gene content of all of these microbes in and on our bodies, we're outnumbered at least uh, 2,000 human genes to about 2 million microbial genes, 20, up to 20 million microbial genes. So it's really important to understand how these microbes are interacting with our health. And so people have been trying to understand what makes an ideal or a healthy microbiome. What are their characteristics? And the jury's still kind of out on a lot of these issues, but it seems like there are at least three different main functions of these genes. Housekeeping genes, so these are the genes that all bacteria need to survive, including transcription, translation, producing energy. Secondly, we have habitat-specific genes. So these are specialized genes that help bacteria to survive in particular human-associated habitats. So for instance, the ability to adhere to host surfaces and produce compounds that might stimulate the immune system, for instance. And finally, we're interested in specialized metabolic functions. So for instance, in the gut, there's some core functions that help us break down different macronutrients. We're also interested in community ecology. So how diverse is the community and how is it structured? And finally, once you establish this healthy microbiome, how do you maintain it? Are you resistant to perturbations? How stable is it over time? So there's a couple of different ways that we can study the microbiome. And I'm going to be talking today a lot about community composition. And so the way that we can analyze community composition is to look at 16S gene sequences. So 16S is a ribosomal subunit, and it's conserved in archaea and bacterial species and required for life. So it's highly conserved. And we can look at sequences of 16S, and in yeast species, we can use an ITS amplicon and just get a snapshot of who is there. So we're curious about who is making up this community. We can use oligotyping for further resolution, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then in addition to who is there, we want to know what are they doing. So there are some different techniques for predicting the possible metabolic functions of the community. And then there's a shotgun metagenomic approach, which some other people will be talking about today. And that will give you a sense of what are the ge genetic capabilities of the microbes that are there. So the 16S RNA gene is a subunit of the prokaryotic ribosome. So it's present in all archaeal and bacterial genomes. And it has very conserved regions and very hypervariable regions. So when you look at across the, the gene, you can find regions that are very conserved and then regions that are very variable. And so what we've done is people have designed primers that bind to these conserved regions, these universal primers, and then they amplify these hypervariable regions, which can be then used as sort of a microbial fingerprint, if you will. And so we can extract DNA from samples, amplify these marker genes, and then put them through this pipeline known as CHIME. So once we have all these amplicons, we get millions of reads from thousands of different samples, we're able to assign taxonomy back to them. And the way that we do this is by using 97% sequence identity, and we call that an operational taxonomic unit, or OTU. And I'm going to be talking a lot today about diversity. So when I'm talking about the community structure, I'll tell you about diversity. And I want to introduce here how we characterize diversity. So we can quantify it in a couple of different ways. So here we have two little cartoon tree communities. And when you're looking at these, you might ask, are these communities equally, di equally diverse or not? And so if you're just looking at the number of different cartoon trees, they seem to have the same diversity, but when you're also looking at the distribution of which of these trees are more common than others. So that will give you sort of a snapshot of diversity. 
not just who's there, but how many of them are there. And then we're looking also at diversity relative to what. So I'll be talking about alpha diversity, and that's really considering diversity within a community. I'll be talking about beta diversity, which is the diversity between communities. And then gamma diversity is the sum of alpha and beta diversity, so that's the overall diversity of a region. So just to hammer home this point a little bit, within sample diversity, we'll be looking at alpha diversity. And that's a measure of richness, so how many different operational taxonomic units are there. So in this little cartoon bacteria instance, we have 11 different kinds of cartoon bacteria, that's 11 different OTUs. And then we're also concerned not just with richness, but with evenness, so what is the distribution of the different cartoon bacteria in our community? And you can see that they don't have equal distribution. So how do we quantify that? And then for beta diversity, we're looking at between sample diversity. So we're really, what we're doing here is making a matrix of the overall similarity between different samples, and then we wanna see what diversity is shared. So there are different metrics that you can do this with. This is a PCA plot that I've taken from the Human Microbiome Project, and this is color-coded by body site. And what this is doing is using abundance-based metrics, so this is a bray curtis distance, which is the difference in the number, the abundance of different taxa, and looking at how they cluster along these axes. So you can see that the orange, which are all the oral samples, seem to cluster with other oral samples, even within an individual. So someone, so your mouth is more similar to someone else's mouth than it is to your gastrointestinal tract. And so you can get this clustering by sample site or by different variables. So this is based on an abundance metric. We're also kind of curious, though, so maybe we care more, when we think about beta diversity, about phylogenetic distance. So maybe it's more informative to think about abundance differences in more divergently, um, phylogenetically divergent taxa. So for instance, here we have some communities, and maybe these communities are different, but maybe we're more interested in their distance from this community over here. So that was just a little intro into how we think about microbial community structure, and now I'm gonna tell you why I study preterm birth. So preterm birth is, is defined as birth before 37 weeks of gestation. And as our technology has improved, we have the increased ability to keep preterm babies alive. However, that comes with a, a lot of complications. So about 50% of preterm infants go on to develop, go on to have neurodevelopmental disabilities. Lots of complications that impact the quality of life. So the US is actually among one of the worst countries. Uh, we are one of the 10 countries with the greatest number of preterm births. And it's a huge economic, societal, and of course emotional burden. Because even with survival, you have all these outcomes and complications estimated to cost the US about $26 billion annually. In addition to the public health component, I'm curious about studying preterm birth because it's an unusual example of microbiota assembly. So when we think about how a normal, healthy term infant develops their microbiota, we think about their mode of delivery, whether they're born vaginally or cesarean section, whether they're fed by breast milk or by formula, their, their length of stay in the hospital, environmental impacts, maternal stress, antibiotics, all of these things go into the development of the microbiota. So the majority of the studies that we've done, uh, that people have done on the human microbiome, have been done in adults. And then the subset that have been done in infants have been primarily done in healthy term infants. But here you have an example in a preterm infant where they're usually an emergency C-section. They're often fed formula or through a tube instead of being breastfed normally with the skin-to-skin -skin contact that, that involves with their mothers. Their mothers are often under a lot of stress and sometimes there's an infection. They have an abnormal environment because they're in this little bubble in the intensive care unit for so long and they have more incidence of antibiotic administration and a longer stay in the hospital. So we know that they are at risk and we know that they have this abnormal microbial community structure, but we don't know how long this persists, if it's something that can be recovered from, and how that will correlate with their longer term health outcomes. So going into this, I have some hypotheses. I thought that you could predict the microbial community structure by some of these variables. So mode of birth, gestational age, how quickly they gain weight, how long they're in the hospital, feeding status, and different immune components like the milk cytokines that they're getting from their mothers, as well as adverse pre and perinatal events. So a lot of these have been looked at in term infants, the birth mode, weight gain, feeding status, um, but I wanted to see how they are reflected in preterm infants. And then for the same infants when they're four years old, I wanted to see 
if they've recovered from this, if they have similar delays in developing the uh, healthy microbial communities compared to their course of the six weeks that they're in the NICU, the beginning of their life. So our approach was in 2012, 67 preterm infants were born in a NICU in the University of South Florida, and their clinical and demographic data was collected as well as weekly stool samples and a bunch of different metadata categories in terms of any morbidities that they experienced, any interventions, milk volumes that they consumed. And now it's 2016 and these same children are four years old and we're following up with them, getting stool samples and collecting physical exam data and neurological and developmental data now. So I'm about to show you some preliminary results from analyzing the infant samples. So this is all done with the 16S marker gene amplification that I showed you before. So this is just looking at in the darker maroon is my data, and then in the lighter color is comparing with a study that was done in healthy term infants. So just to compare phylum level abundances across infants. So you can see that a healthy term infant usually has a decent percentage of firmicutes and actinobacteria, and very little proteobacteria. And that is sort of reversed in, in the infants that we are seeing where they're dominated by proteobacteria. So in healthy term infants, we know that alpha diversity, so the number, both the number of different species that are represented and the evenness of that abundance is increased over, the, over time as they grow. And so I hypothesized that this would also be recapitulated over the NICU stay, but I wasn't sure to what extent. So here I've looked at the first time points, the very first sample that we got from each baby after it was born, compared to the sample just before discharge. And I found that with this metric, there is a significant increase in alpha diversity, so the richness and evenness of uh, species that are found in these infant guts over the course of their NICU stay. So that is encouraging. I hypothesized that this would be different compared um, by feeding status. So feeding status has to do with whether or not the infants received breast milk versus formula milk versus donor milk or um, human milk fortifier. And we've seen in the literature that healthy term infants who are breastfed tend to have higher levels of diversity in their guts compared with formula fed infants. So I thought that this would also hold true for these preterm infants. So in red we have uh, formula only infants, in blue we have babies who received only their mother's own milk, and in green we have any mix of the two, also including donor milk and human milk fortifier. But there were no differences in the alpha diversity by this feeding status. However, when I did this unifrac distance plot, taking into account the phylogenetic differences and looking at beta diversity, so the differences between the samples, again, same color scheme, the red are over here, there's four of them, it's hard to see, um, but all the formula-fed babies are tending to cluster together. And then blue and green, so any mix versus mother's own milk, seem to be indistinguishable. So, and the distribution of ratios of the, the mixed babies, there's about an equal number who received mostly formula and mostly mother's milk. So it seems as though any amount of mother's milk tends to skew the community toward being more like a mother's milk fed infant. So I showed you earlier that it seemed the infants, preterm infants seem to be dominated by these proteobacteria. I broke it down further. So this is genus level, about genus level. This is um, OTU, so these 97% Sequen, uh, sequence identity. And in yellow, we have Enterobacteriaceae, which is a family of proteobacteria. And so you can see that most of the infants, each, each column represents an individual infant. And most of these infants seem to be dominated by this Enterobacteriaceae. So I wanted to go deeper with that, and I used a technique called oligotyping. So what oligotyping does is that it identifies sub-OTU level differences. So within the Enterobacteriaceae family, it uses Shannon entropy to identify the nucleotides in the marker gene that are the most information rich. So here you can see that there are nine of these bars that are really tall. That means that they have higher Shannon entropy and that they can be useful for identifying this sub-OTU level resolution. So I wanted to see if sub-OTUs are, that are acquired in the NICU also persist in the same toddlers. So this is an example of one baby baby 62, who was fed mother's own milk. 
And each color here represents one of these oligotypes. So this baby was dominated by this orange oligotype, so a particular strain, if you will, or species of Enterobacteriaceae. And you can see that the same sample, the same baby, this is the sample when they're four years old, is still dominated by primarily this orange one and then also introducing this purple one. So these, this shows you the um, nucleotides at each of those high entropy positions. Just as just another example, I only have six of the toddlers sequenced so far, but here we have another one. This is baby 53, who had primarily purple and green. And then you see a similar distribution. So what is interesting here is that this, the particular sub-OTUs that were acquired in the NICU seem to be persisting in these same babies when they're four years old. However, they do mature, so there's been studies in healthy term infants, and there's a strong age dependency, so that as you grow and mature, the communities seem to be predicted by age. And the infant samples are all here in maroon, and the toddler samples are all in green. So even though the toddlers are maintaining some of the particular OTUs that they acquired in the NICU, they are still growing, maturing, and are different from the infant samples. So just to summarize up what I've talked about so far, my goal in looking through this data is to identify relationships between the microbiota in these early life stages and the clinical data. My preliminary results indicate that the preterm infant's guts seem to be dominated by proteobacteria, especially enterobacteriaceae, and that the alpha diversity is increasing over time between birth and NICU discharge. I'm also finding that the infant samples will cluster by feeding status during their NICU stay, whether they received breast milk or formula. And that particular sub-OTUs acquired in the NICU seem to persist in the same children when they're toddlers. So going forward, I'm expecting to find differences between these bacterial communities in the infants and toddlers, and I'll stratify them by different clinical morbidities that they experience and interventions that they experience. And I'm hoping to find and model an association between the bacterial community in their NICU stay and that same infant when they're a toddler at age four. So with that, I would like to thank the members of the Gilbert Lab and our collaborators at the University of South Florida and I will take questions. Uh, one thing that caught my eye is the lack of bacteroides on the, on the infants at the beginning of their, uh, the first few samples. Do you have an idea of when they acquired them? Because those are the majority of the adults, right? Like, right. Um, so I think they tend to acquire those over the first couple of years of life, and then the common dogma is that by age three, that they have a more adult-like microbiota. Yeah. So I have to go back and look at that. So they all received antibiotics for sure during their NICU stay, and I wanted to look into, so I had these four, oops, I have four time points each, and that's, sort of my next step will be to look and see if they're getting any antibiotics between these time points in the samples. Um, I know for sure that they all had antibiotics in the NICU, and I'm not sure I have to look in their sort of clinical history. So what we collect from them at age four is sort of a different set of questions. Thank you. Thank you again to Allison. The next speaker up is Kevin Lee. All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Josh. And I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk about our work here. And thank you, Allison, for giving such a great talk on the microbiome. I'm just going to switch gear to talk about um, how the microbiome shaped the immune response. So a lot of this data will be focusing on the immune system itself. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the composition of the microbiota could potentially modulate the allograph rejection. And for those who don't understand uh, the terminology, when you hear the word allo, it means something related to uh, trans, uh, organ transplantation, which has a different genetic background. So organ transplantation is the only cure for end-stage organ failure. Therefore, um, it, even though there are immunosuppression, the graft eventually will be rejected. Therefore, understanding uh, 
the factors that could modulate the strength of the other response is very important. It's the key to improve graph acceptance. And our lab is interested to study the factors that could modulate the strength of the allo reactivity. In terms of the strength of the allo response, it is mainly driven by the genetic disparities between the donor and the recipients. And at the same time, more and more studies have been shown that environmental factors could actually play a role. For example, high salt and high fat diet are shown to accelerate graft rejection. And in collaboration with Anita Chong at the University of Chicago here, we have found that at the time of transplantation, where bacterial infection could actually precipitate graft rejection, suggesting that um, bacteria could play a role. Since pathogenic bacteria express a similar molecular pattern as commensal bacteria, we wonder whether the microbiota that colonize all over our mucosal surfaces could play a role in modulating our responses. And we think this is possible for several reasons. Number one, there are many studies showing that the gut microbiota has a wide range of effects. And these effects include, but not limited to, the T cells differentiation, t reg induction, and IOC functions. At the same time, the gut microbiota are shown to have a distal effect in different uh, locations. So since trans transplant is, a uh, transplant rejection is mediated by the immune response um, mainly. So we wonder, we think this is possible that the microbiota could play a role. And secondly, when you look at the clinical data, you can see that the colonized organ usually have a shorter half-life compared to serial organs. And here we are looking at the first year, third year, and the fifth year uh, graph survival of different types of organs. As you can see that hearts and kidney, which are considered to be a more sterile organ, they have better survival rate compared to the organs that are colonized, such as lung and intestine. And the last piece of evidence is that one clinical study showed that there is a correlation between the changes of the microbiota and tra organ transplant outcome. In this study, they have patients uh, receiving the small bowel transplant, and they monitor the, uh, the microbiome in different phase of rejection. And they found that at the acute rejection phase, they have a reduction in firmicules, particularly in lactobacillus. However, this study did not show that uh, this reduction is, whether this reduction is a cost or consequences of the rejection process. And furthermore, it's not known whether or how the microbiota at the time of transplantation could influence the strength of the L response. So our initial hypothesis is that the microbiota does modulate the strength of the L response. To test this question, we use um, two different models where we monitor the graft survival of an HY expressing skin transplant. So the, this is a male to female transplant where the male skin express the HY antigens. In our first model, we use SPF mouse that are treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics for 10 days. In our second model, we use germ-free mice, which are completely devoid of bacteria and housed in sterile isolator. And the surgeries are done in, in a separate biosafety cabinet. As expected, when a female skin transplants onto a female recipient, which are genetically identical, they do not reject. When the male skin are transplanted onto female recipients, the average rejection time is about 25 days. Interestingly, when we treat both donor and recipients with antibiotic treatment, we see a great prolongation of graft survival. And this only happens when we treat uh, both donor and recipient at the same time. So it's suggesting that both the donor and the recipient's microbiota do play a role in modulating the hour response. And so the, the last slide showed show us the, the minor mismatch. And in here, we also did a major mismatch skin transplant where we transplant about C female skin onto a B6 uh, female recipient. And we also see that with the antibiotic treatment, the, uh, the graft survival is also prolonged. So to understand how the uh, microbiota shape the immune response, 
we adopt to transfer the graph specific cell into the recipient and look for look for the uh, the change of the immune response in the antibody treated mice. In this experiment, again, we treat both donor and recipients with broad spectrum antibiotics for 10 days, followed by a transfer with CFSC labeled uh, HY specific T cells transgenic C4 T cells. And so we call mainly T cells from here on. A day after, we give the transplant and monitor the uh, T cell proliferation at day four by CFSC dilution. As expected, when the mouse did not receive any transplant, they, those T cells did not proliferate because they don't see any HY antigens. And the, in the SPF mouse, which uh, received the transplant, these T cells proliferate uh, much more uh, compared to the antibiotic treated group. So suggesting that the antibiotic treatment does reduce the proliferation of the alloreactive T cells. Since T cells has to see an antigen presenting cells in order to be activated, we wonder whether the antibiotic treatment are actually changing the priming capacity of the antigen presenting cells. So to understand that question, we isolate the antigen presenting cells from the skin, uh, from the skin drain lymph nodes and culture them with those melanin T cells in vitro. So again, it's expected if those T cells since those seizures recognize male antigen, when they are cultured with female APCs, they don't proliferate. And male APCs are capable to induce a robust proliferation of these T cells. And surprisingly, when these T cells are cultured with APCs coming from the antibiotic treated host, they proliferate much less. And they also produce less uh, interferon gamma after restimulation. So we wonder whether these defects are uh, lies within the antigen processing or presentation compartment. Therefore, we isolate the female APCs culturing with the melanin T cells in the presence of male antigen, the HY peptide. Again, as you can see that the antibiotic treated group has a significant reduction in terms of CFSC dilution, which means that the defects that we are seeing here is not because we have a defects in engine presenting or processing. So since DC's dendritic cells are the main APCs in drain lymph node, we wonder whether the antibody treatment are actually changing the function of the, in, of the dendritic cells. So we perform a gene array to look at the, to look at the DC's closely. And what we found is that in the antibiotic treated group, as you can see that they have a reduction in expressing type one interferon and nf kappa b pathway signaling, signaling pathways. And particularly, particularly, we did a transplant with interferon alpha receptor knockout mice. And these uh, receptors are receiving the interferon signals from whoever is producing it. As you can see that when the transplant are done when the donor and recipients are lacking the FNR receptor, their graph survival is prolonged, suggesting that uh, the type one interferon signaling pathway in here plays a role in modulating the graph response. And so this is the first model. And in our second model, we use the germ-free mice. As a, um, if you remember, the average survival rate of a regular SPF transplant is around 20 to 25 days. Surprisingly, when the skin transplant were done in a germ-free condition in germ-free mice, we have a significant prolongation of graft survival. And this kinetics resembles what we have seen before in the antibiotic treated group. Since germ-free mice are known to have many defects in the immune system and other other um, compartments were wondering if this prolongation is due to these defects. So what we did is we transplant a germ-free skin into a regular SPF host. As you can see that um, it brings back to a normal rejection kinetics, suggesting that the germ-free, the defects in germ-free mice is not playing a role in here. And to confirm the role of the microbiota, we actually uh, colonized the germ-free mice with fecal material coming from different hosts. And what we found is that when the germ-free mice that are colonized with fecal material coming from um, a normal SPF mouse, which have a normal mi microbiota, uh, 
it brings back the, um, it, it accelerates the graph rejection back to normal kinetics. And interestingly, this only happens when the germ-free mice are colonized with a normal microbiota. As you can see that, if the germ-free mice are colonized with fecal material coming from the antibiotic-treated host, which has an altered microbiota, they don't have a, uh, an accelerated rejection kinetics, suggesting that these benefits are actually taxa-dependent because the antibiotic treatment are changing the microbiome but not completely eliminating it. So there are some bacteria that stays or some bacteria that are gone could play a role in modulating the L response. So when we look at the, um, the immune system using the same in vitro assay that I just mentioned, uh, we also see that the, the germ-free mice has a um, reduction in terms of primary capacity of those L-reactive T cells. And in the germ-free mice that are colonized with antibiotic-treated uh, feces coming from the antibiotic-treated host also has a reduction in primary capacity. In, in terms of CFSC dilution and also interferon gamma production. So these two slides suggesting that the, uh, the effect of the microbiota is actually taxa dependent, but how does it change? How does the uh, microbiota change the community? To answer this question, we use the 16S uh, sequencing that Alison mentioned. And in here on the left, we are looking at the relative frequency of different phyla of bacteria in each bar represents an, uh, an individual mouse. On the right-hand side, we're looking at the PCOA plot that uh, Alison showed as well. And looking at just looking at the relative frequency, in the orange and the blue, or orange, red, and the blue, we, what we see is that in the antibiotic-treated mice, we see a significant reduction in, in the firmicules. When we subdivide the phyla into different orders, we found that Clostridialis are significantly reduced, and we have a relative expansion, just a slight expansion in Lactobacillus. And interestingly, when we colonize the mice with different types of uh, microbiota, we, we found that the reconstitution is actually not complete. As you can see that in the PCOA plot, on the red and the um, on the orange one, which are the normal SPF microbiota, is quite different to the germ-free mice that are colonized with a normal microbiota, although there are still differences between the antibiotic group and the control group. And at the same time, the germ-free mice that are colonized with the feces coming from the antibiotic-treated host also has a different composition compared to the, the fecal donor. And this also um, happens not only in the gut, but also in the skin microbiota as well. Although this uh, effect is not as prominent as the gut. So um, just want to show you the last piece of data. What we have seen so far in here, we are looking at skin transplantation. Since uh, I just mentioned that the microbiota has a systemic manifestation in different locations, what about sterile organs. And to, un to answer this question, we perform a heart transplant. And we found that um, when you transplant a BM12, which is some MHC mismatch, into a B6 mouse, we see a prolongation of graft survival after, um, after a, the mice are treated with antibiotics, suggesting that the antibiotic treatment or the change of the microbiota does not limit it to um, uh, colonized organ as well. So to summarize my talk, the microbiota is an environmental factor that could modulate LRF um, rejection, and the antibiotic pretreated mice and the germ-free mice have a prolongation of graft survival. And these uh, antibiotic treated mice display a reduction in the primary capacity of to L reactive T cells, which is associated with a decrease in the type one interferon signaling. And lastly, the germ-free mice that are colonized with the microbiota coming from the antibiotic-treated host do not have accelerated graft rejection, suggesting that the effect of the microbiota is actually taxo-dependent. And at the end, I would like to thank my lab who helped me to push this project uh, forward, and I will take any questions that you may have.
Thank you. We use scanomycin, gentamicin, colistin, metronidazole, and vancomycin. All, all of them mixing or? All, all five mixing in a cocktail, giving through the batch. It's a one-time dose? It's a one-time dose every day for 10 days. And the uh, second question is, uh, are you guys talking about like, the timing of, of uh, uh, you know, how long to treat the antibiotics and six months to stop that, and uh, before it starts to recover? Uh, we see a reverse of the beneficial kinetics when we stop the antibiotics starting at day three. Yes. Uh, you just talked about like, COVID and hygiene and how much better hygiene. Um, in the UK, how, how much the microbiologists will play a role in this? We, we haven't sequenced the, the microbiome from B6 mouse, uh, from the BALC mouse. So, but in in the data, in this talk, we show that the BALC skin actually also prolonged after antibiotic treatment. We haven't, we haven't sequenced the microbiome yet. Yes? So to look to see whether or not there's an effect in terms of like the total number of bacteria that are being transferred. So if you take uh, antibiotic treated mice and they transfer their microbiome to a certain free mouse, they transfer the same number of bacteria, do you know if the effect is different? We didn't closely monitor the quantity of the bacteria. All right, thank you. So that concludes the uh, portion of the seminar uh, with new research. Thank you again to Kevin and thank you again to Allison very much. I appreciate uh, your all's participation. Eddie Adams is up next. He's the director of R&D for Mobile Labs. Um, some of you are familiar with him. Uh, for those of you that are already familiar with MoBio and the role that we play, you'll get a little bit of background on uh, what we play with microbiome as well as some updates on where MoBio is heading in the future. So before I'd like to start, I'd like to thank the other speakers for their participation in this MoBio-sponsored event and extend my uh, thanks to the audience members for their attendance. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my colleague Josh Franken for organizing the symposium and inviting me to participate. Um, if I can take a brief survey of the room, how many uh, people here are frequent users of MoBio extraction kits? Okay. And how many of you are, say, completely new to our products? One guy. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally, how many of you um, are currently doing or intend to do any work with protein isolation or mass spec analysis, uh, in, 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 or either currently doing that or intend to do that in the, in the future? Nobody. Wow. Oh, one person. Okay. So the last part of my talk is specifically for you. Um, so my original plan was to give the standard mobile technical presentation highlighting the benefits of doing bead-based homogenization to, to get unbiased uh, representation of the microbes in your sample, as well as uh, emphasize the importance of having some active means of removing PCR inhibitors from your sample. Um, but there have been a lot of changes in, in, at Mobio over the course of the last year with our acquisition by, by Kyogen. And so I thought instead I would talk a bit about uh, how things at Mobio are going to be changing and where you might see um, pro our, our products incorporated into the Kyogen workflow and what value that might have uh, for you in your microbiome research. Uh, the organization of my talk is as follows. Uh, first, I'm just going to give you a very, very brief uh, overview of the acquisition uh, uh, of Mobile by Kyogen. Um, why did they buy us? What, what, what real benefit, um, what value did does Mobile have for, uh, for Kyogen? Uh, then I want to talk about, um, as I said, where you'll see some of our current products and future products incorporated in, into the Kyogen uh, sample to insight workflow. And then finally, I want to introduce you to some uh, new protein kits that we've developed that uh, we hope long term will, be, will sort of become the new gold standard for protein isolation and will enjoy the sort of widespread adoption enjoyed by our uh, uh, DNA and RNA extraction kits. Uh, so Mobio is a 23 year old uh, microbiology company based out of Carlsbad, California. Uh, this was started by a husband and wife um, team, Mark and Liz Berlaski. Uh, 
Uh, Mark was a, originally a founder of a company called Bio 101, which is the first um, company to start offering DNA uh, isolation kits. Um, basically around the same time, or I think a little bit before, before Kaijin actually got started. And uh, if any of you have ever used the Mobile product, UltraClean 15, it's essentially a silica, silica dispersion that gives you really uh, scalable, easily controlled uh, DNA isolation. Um, this was essentially a, a, a op more optimized version of, of um, Bio 101's first product called GeneClean. Um, after Mark left uh, Bio 101 to start, to start off on his own with, with Liz, um, they literally formed their uh, mobile in their garage. First, first doing DNA, uh, DNAs and RNAs free certification for companies like Axigen and Eppendorf. And it grew out of that garage into a, a um, manufacturing and R&D facility in Carlsbad, California, with over 50 employees and products sold in over 90 countries. Um, so why did Kaijin have an interest in the acquisition of mobile? Well, really, uh, this was a, a strategic acquisition to support their long-term plans for, the, for their next-gen sequencing platform, the Gene Reader. Um, mobile, Kaijin has had a great track record for uh, analyzing research and market trends and predicting when a particular field is going to, is going to really blossom, and then having products positioned to, to uh, supply those, those markets. Uh, they've succeeded brilliantly in the clinical diagnostics realm. Uh, with this, selling, selling kits to uh, clinical diagnostic laboratories and perhaps just as importantly, automation platforms on which to run, to run those kits. Um, and right now, the bet they're making is that the basic microbiome research that you are all doing is going to give way in the not too distant future to a whole new era of clinical diagnostics and microbiome-based therapeutics with market projections in the billions of dollars. Uh, the gene reader is positioned to take advantage of this, of this trend, um, as, or this transition from basic research to clinical uh, decision making. And the idea is, is pretty simple. It's that right now when you do microbiome-based analysis, you're sequencing everything in your sample. But for, uh, for certain clinical um, decisions, maybe you only need to know about 5, 10, or 15 <coughs> microbes present in your sample or their gene products. And that's really where the gene reader is meant to uh, have the greatest value, is that in contrast to sequencing everything, you would be sequencing a panel of, of a, a much smaller panel of uh, highly multiplex barcoded uh, amplicons. The idea, the idea being that um, as microbiome research progresses and we start to know that there are distinct biomarkers for particular disease conditions, you would focus all of your attention on those, biomark on those validated biomarker panels. So right now, product development at Kaijin has focused on, has on, has focused on oncology, where uh, distinct biomarker panels are, are really well validated. So it makes sense to start here. But longer term, uh, product development will focus on, on microbiome-based uh, assays and, and biomarker uh, and panels. In order to be successful in this space, however, uh, Kaijin needed to improve its product offerings for microbial DNA and RNA isolation, and the most efficient way to do this was to acquire Mobile. Uh, among the many benefits of taking over Mobile was, was gaining ownership uh, of, of our key patent, uh, which is shown here, which is the patent that, pr that protects uh, the formulation and the use of our inhibitor removal chemistry. Uh, we are the only company that has a, a patented chemistry-based methodology for removing organic and inorganic contaminants from a sample lysate. Uh, these are contaminants that, if retained uh, and uh, come through in your eluent, will inhibit uh, successful ne next-gen sequencing library prep. And so if you imagine doing clinical diagnostics in a stool sample, uh, it, having, an, having a built-in inhibitor removal chemistry would be, would be absolutely key. Uh, and it's the efficiency of this chemistry when coupled with effect, with, when coupled to effective microbial license afforded by bead-based homogenization that's led to such widespread adoption of our kits throughout uh, the microbiome research and metagenomic, metagenomics community. And of course, Kaijin saw enormous value in, in acquiring a company that has such widespread adoption uh, by, by researchers in these fields. So now that we are a part of Kaijin, 
what are some salient changes you'll see uh, aside from our kits showing up in red and blue boxes? Uh, the first thing you'll see is an effort to incorporate mobile kits onto Kaijin automation platforms. So as of January of this coming year, uh, a number of our kits uh, shown here in the middle uh, will be, uh, you'll be able to run on the Kaijin uh, KaiCube. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this instrument, uh, this is a really fantastic piece of equipment that essentially is a, is a micro centrifuge coupled to a liquid handler that allows you to run all of your standard spin column, uh, spin column protocols in a completely hands-off fashion. Uh, we are going through and developing this protocol so that all of the IRT precipitations can be done on board. So literally the only hands-on step that you would have to do is loading your sample into B-tubes and doing that first homogenization, transfer of lysate to, to um, the Kaijin consumable, and from then on, everything else would be handled in a completely hands-off fashion. So and this saves you, this saves you a huge, huge amount of time. I mean, these, this instrument can handle 12 samples at, uh, uh, at once. Um, but for those of you who are accustomed to doing spin column protocols, you know that, that, those, that those 12 samples represent uh, an awful lot of time. So being able to hit a button and walk away and come back and have Eluent uh, ready for you, it um, really makes um, life a lot easier. And for the price of one of these instruments, the, the amount of time and throughput it gains you uh, is quite significant. Uh, in other ways that you would see, you'll see uh, integration going forward is um, coupling mobile products to Kaijin products that you might not be familiar with. So uh, one example would be uh, the, the Kaijin, um, sorry, Kaijin's microbial DNA qPCR arrays. Uh, these are these are really nice products where essentially in uh, 96 or 34 well plates you have pre-printed. Uh, primer and probe TACMAN assays. So in this example here, you have a si element from a single sample going across either 90 distinct uh, microbial species, uh, qPCR assays, or qPCR assays for, for gene products, um, as well as some built-in built -in controls to report whether or not you have bacteria, fungi, uh, or, or, and there's some inhibition controls as well. Uh, these, these are really flexible arrays. Um, as I said, you can have a single sample going, going across 90 distinct assays or um, multiple, multiple, multiple eluents going across the, the, the same assay plus their respective controls. And then more long, in the longer term, um, as I indicated, you're going, to, you're going to see Mobio as part of a, uh, integrated into uh, Kaijin's, what they're calling the sample to insight. We're literally go, starting from a sample, um, Sorry, the entire time I've been using a mouse, I didn't realize that you weren't, you weren't able to see it. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, going, st starting from a sample, uh, you can use any, uh, any of the uh, Kaijin or Mobio homogenization methodologies in our, in our B-tubes, uh, through our extraction kits, library prep, the gene reader, and then use, uh, using uh, Kaijin's uh, data analysis tools to give you insight into, into your sample but through the identification of particular biomarkers of interest. Um, so now I'd like to, in the remaining minutes, just give you um, an introduction to some new, some new uh, um, products we've, we've been working on that we initiated prior to the acquisition by Kaijin. And our motivation for, for working on, uh, on protein uh, isolation was not only customer driven, but also as we looked at the microbiome field, it seemed to make sense, and I, and I hope that we're correct, that uh, as, we, as we get through sort of the, the surveying portion of, of microbiome research where you're, you are identifying what organisms are present, um, and you start to focus more on what are the functions of these communities or, or distinct members of these, uh, of these communities, we'll want to know what gene products are actually turned into functional protein. <clears throat> And one example that I'll share with you that I, that I think uh, is, is a really useful demonstration of this is this paper um, from Environmental Science and Technology where in a single paper, these authors went from uh, a single, identifying a species of uh, sphingobium, sorry, it's hard to pronounce, um, that was shown to, that was, act, that was isolated from an activated sludge 
uh, based on its active, it's based on its ability to degrade bisphenol A. Uh, they sequence the genome um, uh, of this of this species. With the genome in hand, they were then able to do quantitative proteomics and, met and, and metabolomics. And they were able to, to not only were they, were they able to identify a unique uh, metabolite, but they were also able to identify the, the enzyme that was responsible for the conversion of bis bisphenol A into this hydroxylated metabolite. They then went on and were able to quantify a number of other enzymes in, in bold. Uh, again, because they, had, they, had, they were armed with the, with the genome of this organism. So I thought this was a really nice demonstration in, in a single paper of going from this isolated but unknown species to the genome to quantitative proteomics. Uh, you know, once upon a time, just doing the genome, of the, the genome of this organism alone would have been a paper. But in a single paper, because these technologies had become so efficient and so inexpensive, uh, they were able to put three really technically advanced analyses uh, together and come up with a really nice story. Um, so when we turned our attention to doing protein extraction, and we asked ourselves, well, what are, what are some things that are currently lacking in the field, and what, what would really benefit people who, who might be new to proteomics, new to, new to protein isolation? And the thing that stood out to us was that protein isolation, generally speaking, is pretty, is pretty clumsy. And it is um, something that has sort of been the providence of biochemists who are, who are not really opposed to working with things like trichloroacetic acid and a lot of organic solvents. But, we, but we've always, we've always uh, believed that we should make our kits as simple, as simple to follow and as, as, uh, as uncomplicated as possible. And so what we, what we wanted to do was come up with a solution that would make protein isolation as, as easy and routine as DNA and RNA isolation. Um, and so what we ended up coming up with was a, a, a really novel methodology for using the same DNA silica spin filters that you use for DNA and RNA isolation uh, to actually re reversibly immobilize protein. Uh, um, so you are able to bind total protein from your lysate, wash away impurities, and then elude off uh, extremely efficient, in an extremely efficient fashion. And so within, within 20 minutes, you can go from sample to a total, total proteome of your organism of interest without, without any trichloroacetic acid, phenol, or any organic solvents at all. And so our hope is that by introducing these tools, uh, we, will, we, will make, uh, we will make protein isolation as, as, uh, as accessible as uh, DNA and RNA isolation. Um, so we have two kits coming out. Uh, one has already been released. We have another, we have another two kits coming out in September. Uh, the one that has been released is the Novapure Microbial Protein Kit. So this is for, uh, for bacteria and fungal cultures. Um, much like most bio, much like most bio kit, most most bio kits, you start off with uh, resuspending your uh, pellet in a lysis buffer, uh, doing bead-based homogenization. You centrifuge, take off your supernate, and combine it with a with a proprietary bind, which gives you that uh, reversible mobilization to uh, to the silica spin filter. You wash and you loot. You loot in one percent SDS, um, but we've also shown that other detergents, the mass spec, mass spec compatible detergents can, uh, can be used. Uh, just to show you some data, um, in, all of these, uh, in all of these images, C is just the crude lysate without any purification at all. Uh, and then the two, the two replicates are, uh, are the spin column uh, isolated. So we have uh, various uh, fungal species, uh, gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria. Uh, we have uh, excellent yields from these protocols. Uh, from a single milliliter of e, uh, e. coli, you can get close to uh, a milligram of, um, of total protein, so more than enough to do uh, mass spec and other downstream analyses. Um, comp fully compatible with uh, 2D uh, SDS page analysis. And we, um, we, wanted, to, we wanted to demonstrate uh, to, the, to the proteomics community that using not only our chemistry, but this, this method of, sil of uh, spin column-based isolation, that you were not giving up anything. Um, so we did a comparison by mass spec of, uh, of our chemistry 
um, compared to sort of a, a standard in the proteomics field, which is, which is sodium carbonate. Uh, sodium carbonate lysis is typically followed by precipitation. Uh, and essentially, we, we, we performed our kit versus the sodium carbonate methodology, um, did spin column purification of, of our method, ran them on a gel, excise, excise bands in these regions, and submitted that to mass spec, and basically we saw equivalent, equivalent results. So we've done a, a few iterations of this, different, taking different regions of the gel, but we are essentially are not experiencing uh, any loss as a consequence of going over a spin filter, uh, and we are not getting any bias when compared to sort of the uh, proteomics uh, standard methodology. Um, time is running out, but I, so I simply want to end on um, introducing a kit that will be coming out in September, which allows you to do um, sort of analogous to the Kyogen all prep kits. This allows you to take a single sample isolate DNA, RNA, and protein without having to do any sample splitting at all over three different uh, um, uh, silica spin columns. And this, this works beautifully. Um, again, we have uh, DNA, some of these different organisms, uh, total RNA, including small RNAs, and, and total protein bound, bound, to, bound to and released from silica spin filters. Um, we've shown that uh, the, the RNA is, um, you're not biasing your RNA isolation by only pulling in large RNAs. We, we, see, we see plenty of uh, low molecular weight RNAs. Um, this, was, this was using a um, Affymetrix, uh, data generated with the Affymetrix uh, uh, microarray and um, compatible with all downstream uh, analysis methodologies. And so with that, um, I'd like to end and take any questions you may have. I would like to note that the, um, uh, the motivation for working on these protein kits um, uh, came to us from customers who are looking to do DNA, RNA, and protein from, from stool. And so the follow-up to the last kit I showed you is incorporation of IRT so that people can start uh, using this in uh, gut microbiome and uh, metaproteomic studies. So that was the underlying motivation. Thank, Thank you. you to Eddie. Our uh, last speaker here is Sarah Owens from Argonne National Lab. Uh, as Josh said, my name is Sarah Owens, and I work at Argonne National Laboratory in the Environmental Sample Preparation Sequencing Facility. Uh, we've been working with MoBio for about six years or so doing this kind of research. Uh, so we're really familiar with each iteration of our kits um, and also the quality of the DNA that we get out of those kits. Um, so our facility generates a lot of the types of data that you heard about this morning, uh, primarily 16S and shotgun metagenomics. Um, up top, because I always forget to say this, that um, our facility is cost recovery <coughs> and fee for service. So you can send your samples to us and we will sequence them. We will extract the DNA for you. Uh, so if you have seen something that you're interested in today, but you're worried you won't quite be able to, to cut it uh, with your current lab capabilities, um, you can always send your samples to us. So I always forget to say that, so let me get that out of the way. Um, I'm gonna start with some, and I apologize if this is a little rudimentary, but I'm gonna start with some terms in metagenomics. Um, because when you're talking to someone like me who wants to get you the right kind of data, it's really important to use the right words when you're talking about it so that I know what you mean when you want a certain type of data. Uh, so an amplicon is a uh, targeted, uh, the use of a marker gene. So like 16S that Allison was talking about and Kevin was talking about. Um, 18S, which is often used for eukaryotes and fungi, and ITS, which is most commonly used for fungi. So any sort of targeted sequencing is usually called amplicon sequencing or targeted sequencing. Uh, a genome, obviously, is all of the genes in an organism. A metagenome is all of the genes of all of the organisms present, so often in a, a community that uh, some of the samples that you might have. Um, a transcriptome is all of the mRNA that's associated with a single organism. And a metatranscriptome is all the mRNA in all of the samples, in all of the organisms in the sample. And a library is just a sample that has been prepared to be sequenced. Okay, so um, this talk is gonna be a little bit about all the things that you need to think about before you get started in a project like this. Um, so designing your study, 
collecting your samples, making sure you get high quality DNA or RNA for your study, uh, generating the library, sequencing, and then analyzing the data. These are all things that I would argue you should think about before you even take your first sample. Uh, you've seen a similar workflow like this before, but you want to have metadata, um, your sample, and then um, eventually a plan for sequencing and analysis um, all up top. Uh, it's really important, this might seem like it goes without saying, but you want to establish what you want to find so you know where to look. What kind of data do you need on the end to uh, achieve the goal that you have um, for your study? And you should design your experiment with this in mind. So you should make sure that you're collecting samples that will be amenable to microbial analysis. And you should um, make sure that you uh, collect samples that, um, you know, if you need replicates, if you need special storage, you need to be plan, you know, plan up front for all of this. Uh, depending on the study, a lot of you know this, but uh, you'll need perhaps certain permission, you'll need an IRB in place, you'll need um, all kinds of things at the beginning that you might not have access to. The worst is if you take samples, you're really requiring um, patient consent to get all of the data that's associated with your study, and then you find out that you've collected the samples first, you don't have that consent, and then now you have no patient information that you can use associated with that sample, and that could be really critical for finding any sort of trends uh, in, your, in your data. Uh, it's also important to consider a lot of the, um, the, the cost of your experiment up front. I have a lot of people who come to me later and see how much it's going to cost to sequence, and then they are shocked and disappointed and then have to cut out half of their samples. And so really you want to make sure that you consider all of these, um, all of these concerns up front, um, having all your, sam your uh, sampling tools, your receptacles labeled. I have, have a lot of people who lose track of samples, who um, have lots of problems just getting the samples collected in a way that is easy to track and easy to characterize. And then, I know this sounds really silly, but all of these problems I've encountered, and then, and then researchers are scrambling once they have data to try to figure out, uh, to go back and to try to track everything. Um, when you're dealing with samples like this, it's obviously important to utilize sterile technique, because if you're interested in the microbes, you don't want any other sort of contaminating microbes in your samples. Um, and I even suggest to kind of do a dry run and, and try to collect your samples in a way before you get going to make sure that you can uh, accurately collect the samples in a way that is efficient. Uh, maybe if you want to, if it's time sensitive in terms of storage that you want to make sure you do it quickly. Um, and then also have any extra sampling supplies you need in case there are some mistakes. Uh, these are just a few articles. I know this is in soil. Um, we are primarily an environmental lab, but basically these publications just highlight the importance of DNA extraction on comparability across studies. And so um, a lot of researchers, as Eddie pointed out, are using the MoBio products for their microbiome studies uh, in, with fecal samples, as, you know, as well as in soil, different um, studies. And so it's good to check for cross-study comparability before you get started with your extractions. And in terms of extraction considerations, um, so our, our lab uses the, mo, uh, the modified MoBio power soil kit uh, with, a, with a heating step in, in, the, in the beginning of the extraction so that we get as many microbes out as possible. Um, if you're working with a high biomass sample, like stool, you might want to add less sample than is recommended for, your, for, the, for the protocol. And if you're working with a really low biomass sample, um, you're going to want to perhaps collect more samples, say, say three swabs for your study. So uh, just in case if you um, run into a low biomass, if you have a low extraction, uh, then you could perhaps pool those samples afterwards. Um, often our group will do test extractions for a really precious project. And so if you have a few samples that you're not sure if it's going to pan out, you think it really seems like it could be great, but you're not sure if you're going to get enough DNA out, um, we'll often do a few, you know, three different tries. Maybe we'll have a solution with it. Um, uh, we'll do 
you know, just the swab and maybe something else to kind of try to really amp up that um, yield on your DNA extraction. So a lot of these things are pretty quick, uh, pretty small that you can do before you take all of your samples and then realize that you're going to have a challenge with the, with the DNA you get out. Uh, another tip is that if you're thinking of doing anything with RNA, uh, you should either complete your RNA extraction as soon as possible, so I mean, essentially fresh sample to tube. Uh, if you can't, then it's really great to use LifeGuard RNA later or a similar preservative for your RNA samples. Uh, and we've done some tests in our group and another group at Argonne. Uh, we really see a difference when we use these preservatives, so it's really critical to use something like this. And then library preparation uh, is really important. Again, this, this conversation about the type of data you want and uh, your expectations and really clearly communicating that. Um, so, you know, different types of sequencing are different, are necessary for different types of questions. So community composition, uh, shotgun metagenomics uh, is, is necessary for possible function. And if you're looking for any sort of activity, you really want metatranscriptomes or transcriptomes. Um, there's also some special considerations for RNA samples. And this is particularly critical um, to work with a, mic a lab that understands microbes uh, for RNA because you can't just use standard kits. Uh, you need to make sure that you are enriching for what you want, that you're re removing ribosomal RNA. If you have a sample that might have some host and uh, some host contamination, you want to make sure you remove the host and also the ribosomal RNA subtracted um, associated with that. Uh, so you really need to um, tailor your prep to the type of sample you have, and that's what our group uh, is really familiar with doing. Uh, so typically, uh, when you work with a group like ours, you'll be asked what kind of sequencing you want to do, and then also what platform you're expecting to use. And so this is just kind of a guide to show that we're typically running on the MySeq, uh, the targeted assays, and some uh, single genomes. We're typically using uh, running shotgun metagenomes and metatranscriptomes on the HiSeq. So for uh, the targeted assays, you don't need quite as much data. And that's what the, the MySeq gives you, about 20 million reads. And the HiSeq high gives you about 200 million reads. So we can run anywhere from about 900 samples uh, from a targeted assay on the MySeq. And we are typically running only about four or five metagenomes uh, per HiSeq lane. So it gives you a scale of how much data you need for shotgun metagenomics. So um, another thing that I, I didn't mention on the last slide is that not only is the sequencing depth important for the application, but it's also important to consider your read length. So if you are working with an amplicon, like the uh, V4 region we're working with, the 515-806, uh, it's only about uh, 290 base pairs long, and when it's sequenced, it's actually about 253 base pairs. Uh, so it would be kind of overkill to sequence uh, 600 base pairs on an amplicon that's less than three, 300 base pairs. Um, so that's some of the considerations that you need to be making when you're, when you're selecting a run length. You know, longer isn't always better when you're talking about sequencing, but you want to consider quality, you want to consider the, the length of your target, you want to consider um, a lot of aspects of the workflow. And, and that's the kind of thing that talking to someone who's an expert uh, in this field um, would, would be able to help you with. Um, in addition, a lot of times you're buying from a petition that you're working with, or if that's you, <laughs> and you're, you're really um, trying to learn a lot about um, metagenomics, um, they will care how you've sequenced it. And the problem is that you've, if you have data and you hand it off to the person and you're just then talking to them, uh, they might be pretty disappointed in the selection that you've made. Um, so, and you can't go back and say, well, actually, could you make the DNA, you know, 500 base pairs in length when you sequence it? Well, it's already, it's already been completed. And so really, this is, this is the motivation for um, collecting samples uh, from the time you, you know, start collecting samples to really having these conversations about the kind of data you need for your study and then also um, how to generate it. <clears throat> so, you know, I've already kind of highlighted this, but basically just planning ahead based on the sequencing cost can help culminate 
uh, eliminate having to knock down samples for your design. Um, it's important to sequence the appropriate length for your libraries and the platform. Uh, sequencing longer reads doesn't necessarily lead to better data. Um, it also can lead to adapter contamination and decreased data quality because even though the Illumina platforms are really getting great at the increased read lengths, they are still dropping off at the ends of the, the sequencing reads. And the, the quality is still dropping off at the sequencing reads. So you don't need those longer reads. Don't use them. Um, and sequencing really is not one size fits all. Uh, so if you take anything away from this, uh, from this uh, presentation that I'm giving, it would be that you need to uh, talk with um, your sequencing facility and make sure that they know about doing microbiome research and that they understand that. Um, and also that you need to have a really high quality DNA going in to the process as well. Um, you know, again, some more, some more pitfalls and concerns seem kind of negative. <laughs> um, but, you know, not asking questions about the sequencing, um, you know, just handing over your samples and saying, here, prep this for a microbiome study um, is, is a real issue. Um, and then also making sure that your uh, DNA extraction isn't quite right. If you just have a kit laying around the lab that you've always used, but it's not for microbes, um, you're probably going to end up with... Um, lower quality DNA than you want, especially if there's uh, humic acids or any sort of inhibitors in that sample. Um, I'd also advise against using samples that you've just got on hand in your freezer that you think, oh, I'd like to know about the microbes that are in these samples. Because it's a possibility if it's a biopsy or if it's some sort of sample that um, is going to have a lot of contaminating material in addition to your microbes. Uh, you may not get the best, the best result. You might just have a lot of mitochondrial sequence data and not a lot of microbes. Um, and so that, that'll skew your results. So, you know, instead, you could do use a swab or a brush or some sort of other type of sampling implement um, on samples to make sure you're getting the microbes. Do you have any questions about sequencing? Um, either now or after lunch, um, I'm available. Thank you.